Hello again. Welcome back to the day, another week of daily Bible study. We're continuing on with the book of Acts, and we're going to start uh, at the beginning of chapter 8, although half of the first verse was really part of the last passage. So we're starting with what you could call chapter 8, verse 1b. Uh, you'll, it'll make sense when we get there, there together. Before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we are moving into a new phase of the life of the church. It is very quickly going to become something that's not just a local affair, but beginning to be a worldwide movement. Lord, we ask you to watch over us as we consider this passage to help us to see what it means, not just once upon a time, but for us today. Lord, be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is going to be a fascinating little passage that's going to illustrate something that may not be realized by everybody. But So starting on the second half of uh, verse 1, this is what we read. And on that day, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there's much rejoicing in that city. So here's a passage, and I want to highlight two things. And, and um, one of them is just the fact that the ministry of the disciples is starting to look more and more like the ministry of Jesus. We saw some of that happening in uh, Jerusalem. And maybe you could say, yes, you know, that makes sense because Jerusalem is the place where the temple is. It's where God has made his home. If you're going to have an experience of God with the miraculous, this is the place where you might have it. Uh, and yet now we're starting to see this in Samaria. Now, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, so Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and I, I, I try to remember that I think Philip is one of the one of the apostles. But my point is, so it's, it's first of all realizing that the people, Jesus had said, you will do the things that I'm doing. In John's gospel, he says, you will do the things that I'm doing. In fact, you will do greater things than these because I go to the Father. And so I want to draw a, an explicit connection between the things that Philip here is described as doing, that we've seen Peter and John do in the past, and what Jesus was doing. These are not It's not a coincidence that they're doing the same kinds of things. They are disciples who are following their master. Disciples do what their master does. They see what he does. They follow him. They do what he does. And and also Jesus proclaimed that to be the case. And so while Philip in this case is not the son of God made flesh like Jesus uh, is and was, he is, however, a human being who has been empowered by the very spirit of God. And I become aware of, of a kind of contemporary movement that's really emphasizing this thing called third article theology. And the concern that they've had is that by this such emphasis on uh, Jesus as being this unique individual uh, has some blind spots. They don't want to stop talking about that. I want to be really clear that this is not uh, an anti-Jesus movement, at least in the the people I've seen. Um, But this idea of saying, focusing so much on the uniqueness of Jesus without also representing what the Holy Spirit is doing in Jesus uh, can, can cause some blind spots, not least among us Christians today who can see our differences with Jesus as being all the reasons why we shouldn't expect to do some of the things that Jesus was doing. And so this idea of Philip is a human being. He is not, at the same time, the Son of God. But that very same God is present inside of him by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is present inside him, therefore the Spirit of God is present inside of him, and therefore he can do at least many of the things that Jesus did. It doesn't turn him into a new Jesus in his core, but it does allow him to manifest the very kinds of things that Jesus was doing. And the reason why I say that is because uh, what's the difference between Philip and us? And the answer is nothing. Nothing's different. Now we can look at, say, what's the difference between you and Jesus? And we can say, well, Jesus is God in flesh and I'm not. But Philip isn't either. And And Peter isn't. And John isn't. And yet we see the Spirit of God manifesting in these ways. So um, I don't know how I, where I fall on the map with, with modern day Pentecostalism as such, but any attitude that says the Holy Spirit did some stuff once upon a time and now no longer is interested in doing stuff, uh, just, I, I find no place where that can make any sense at all uh, in the New Testament. We see the people of God who are following Jesus acting and doing the same kinds of things that Jesus was doing. Now, we don't necessarily hear, hear everybody doing the same miracles, but we do see even the miraculous playing a role. So we should be expecting God to move in our midst. We should be surprised. Uh, this is not just our heritage as Christians. You know, I'm a, I'm a Methodist. And, you know, part of the heritage as Methodists is that the Spirit was doing some of these kinds of things. And it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that the modern Pentecostal movement was birthed out of people who were largely influenced by those, uh, by, by Methodists. 
I just say that to say this is part of my tradition and it's probably, it might well be part of your tradition if you're watching this as well. But the other thing I want to highlight, and this is absolutely crucial as well, is what's happening here. It's so easy to think that the reason why the gospel spread was because the apostles were spreading it. And that's certainly true, at least in Jerusalem itself. You know, in Jerusalem, the apostles absolutely were the driving forces of mission and ministry. But we need to realize the fact that the apostles stayed put. They didn't generally start uh, a traveling ministry. We think of that kind of ministry, but, but that's mostly Paul that we read about at least so far. So far in this story, they've mostly stayed put in Jerusalem. They've been providing leadership where there are Christians. But I want you to point out here, it says, so, so uh, on, the day, on that day after Stephen died, uh, there was a great persecution that began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So, and it said that those who... Um, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So now we have primarily the new preaching that's taking place among new people who have never heard of Jesus before. This is all taking place by people who are not the apostles. You know, they might be some of the deacons who are still alive. They might be the, the lay folks. But we need to realize is that the early church spread fastest and most profoundly, not because the apostles got everywhere. The apostles did do some traveling, but they themselves, that group of people did not by themselves change it. It was the people, the rank and file Christians who were traveling for business, who moved from one location to another for different prospects, who you know, in, engaged with those who were visiting in Jerusalem and all the places. It's the normal people who bear, bore witness to Jesus wherever they went. That's what spread the gospel. And again, that's not a really surprise uh, for me as a Methodist either because the Methodists didn't get going in America because John Wesley sent folks. It was mostly folks who moved to America and said, this is important. We got to keep living this way for Jesus, uh, regardless of whether we're connected with this structure back home. We need to start. We need to start one if there isn't one. And overwhelmingly, the expand the story of the growth of American Methodism has to do with the fact that people were in one community and they said, down the road, there's a new settlement, and they don't have a Methodist class meeting yet. We're going to go start one. And this is how the church grows. The church does not grow historically because they had fantastic preachers. That might provide a focal point, that might provide some instruction, but the church and the spread of the gospel happens because the faithful people of God are sharing their faith with the people that they meet, with the places that they go, and the places that they move. And that is how it has always been. And so it is easy to kind of try to outsource uh, to leaders. Now, the leaders have a role to play too. I'm not trying to get myself off the hook as well. But the point is, it is so easy to blind ourselves to the fact that as ordinary folks who God has called, that that's where God puts the plan for evangelism. And I want you to know that because that's vitally important. And we see it explicitly here in the story in Acts. Well, that's all for today. Come back tomorrow. We'll have more of the book of Acts. Have a good day.